Hey everybody, welcome to back to episode three of Inception Point. If you're new to the channel, this is Inception Point. My name is Kanal Thoria. Our guest today is Mike, or as he goes by Chicken, Dabulas. Mike is a professional rugby player whose dad happened to be a former coach of mine. Mike, would you like care to give a introduction of yourself and how you became a professional rugby player? Yeah, so um, from Westfield, New Jersey, uh, went to Westfield Public High School, grew up around here. Um, Started playing rugby when I was, I don't know, seven. Dad was my coach. Just grew up around the sport. So, obviously, I just had to play it. And then um, played it all through middle school, high school, and then decided to want to play it in college. Played it there for a while, four years. And then, luckily, the MLR came around, hopped on there. Luckily, I was lucky enough to get drafted the mlr really came at an interesting point in our careers especially as uh young as younger rugby players because the people before kind of went to private clubs or other places but like that real place where it was the first professional draft in combine because mm-hmm. i remember i got the email as well like mlr is having a college combine and college uh, draft kind of jumping into the starting point so you kind of briefly mentioned how your dad had an influence on you starting rugby you grew up around the sport so really, if you want to go a little bit more into detail on um, that, so your dad played rugby. Did he play in America? Or did he play overseas? Or where did he kind of start? Yeah, so he he didn't play overseas. He played just club okay. in um U.S. Um, he started when he was young, not younger, about mid to late 20s. Okay. Um, he was staying at a friend's house, and he said, as long as you stay here, you have to play rugby brought him to a practice and he was hooked since um I was basically thrown into it the culture basically because I would just be brought to games when I was younger and I just really fell in love with it from there watching the games seeing it sport in general so when did you kind of really start well start actually like join your first team and start playing that was probably so I did flag um <clears throat> but if we're talking like tackle I was probably like 10 Okay. Um, and then from there, just progressed. Got it. So h- how popular was it went around you when you started playing? Was there a lot of people playing? Was it really little? It was definitely more of like a a small niche type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not the most popular sport, but if you're a part of it, you were like a part of this culture that went more than the sport. Got it. So, yeah, no, I get that entirely. It's, I, I do, I do get that feeling, especially it's the sport, which my, one of my previous coaches used to t- call it. It's the only place where you can bash the living daylights out of another player, then go grab, go hang out. And we, what we used to do is grab pizza with them right after the game. Or mm-hmm. even if uh, for those people who drink, they'd go to the bars. Yeah. So were there, was that the only sport you played or did you play other sports growing up? So I played almost every sport growing up um at least for a little bit i was from i played soccer until senior year of high school since i was in kindergarten um lacrosse for a while dabbled with football um basketball you name it i've probably played it for a little at least a little bit i think you mentioned football so sophomore year of high school i joined the football team I grew up a soccer player as well, but what happened was um, my parents were kind of in name okay with me playing football. My mom, especially my mom, she was used to me coming back with bru- uh, bruises and bumps and scratches and on, on my legs, not mm-hmm. on my upper body. So sophomore year, I started playing football. For, um, I lasted about two months before my mom literally pulled the plug and she's like, absolutely not. I came back with this ginormous bruise on my arm. And no, I was on my chest. Um and she's like, absolutely not. This is not happening. Um, I was like, put up a fight. Dad, you can't let her do this. Like, I want to play football. He goes, you heard your mom. So what was your favorite games play? Was it 15s? Was it 7s? Would you like to honors of explaining to our audience the difference between the two? Uh, so it's not that hard to explain. It's uh, 15. There's 15 per side on each team. And then 7s, obviously 7s. I like 7s more just because there was more space for me to run um get a little more creative but 15s definitely i think i could do a lot better in got it so what positions did you uh generally end up playing 
So I was probably 10 for both. Um, okay. And then later on in my college career, I was getting more put at um, center and uh, fullback. Got it. What is What exactly is the position of 10 supposed to be? What's, what are the responsibilities and such? So for people that understand football, it's kind of like uh, the QB of the offense. All the, all the offense goes through the 10, basically, especially at – the high school and college level okay so yeah you're calling the plays you're looking reading the defense orchestrating the offense basically got it so you said you also played uh center and you played wing as well and fullback so the wing is the wide receiver fullback is uh more of a safety for those people of those positions though what was your overall favorite position to play 10 for sure yeah yeah i just felt like i create more do more at that position Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I do see that a lot. Um, was that the first position you played? So I started off as a scrum half. Okay. When I was younger, and then slowly, well, not slowly, just sharply tapered off into 10. What, what, what made you kind of want to make that change? Well, it was mainly my dad. Oh, okay. He was a coach Fair at enough. the time, so he goes, all right, you're playing 10 now. And I go, all right, didn't really have a choice in the matter. Uh, yeah, I feel that. Your dad was a big influence in you kind of getting into rugby and playing? Yeah, for sure. Growing up. Were yeah. there other people around you also, like his friends or uh, uncles or anyone else who played as well? Or was it just... We were the only people in my family to okay. really play, but his friends would be around a lot. He had some good friends who have family friends that played. So he was pretty deep in the culture and yeah. Got it. Uh, did you guys watch a lot of rugby growing up as well or not so much? Really not that much, which I'm kind of surprised thinking about. Um, we probably should have watched some more. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so you don't really have a favorite team then? or no, do you? Surprisingly not, no. <clears throat> so for me, it was kind of the other way around my coaches forced me to watch saying that that's the only way you're going to really understand what you're going to be, uh, what you're going to do. So just throwing video after video by my coaches, um, watch this game, watch that game. One of the main teams that I was told to start watching first was New Zealand All Blacks. And surprisingly enough, I found I had uh, my dad's college roommate was also living in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So he would send me a lot of uh, their stuff as well. Being the main, that's the team that introduced me to rugby. I kind of just stuck with them. Mm -hmm. And them happening to being one of the best teams in the uh, world was like complimentary to it as well. Yeah. You played, uh, you played through high school. You went to college. Uh, Where, what college did you go to? Where'd you play? I played up at uh, Penn State. Did you know going to college you want to play rugby and did that influence your kind of wanting to choose Penn State or absolutely yeah absolutely I knew that when I was looking for colleges that I definitely wanted to play rugby and not just for any team I wanted to play for like one of the better teams in the country okay so how did that work was it similar to the NCAA process where like there's scouts that you're sent out or do you actually go there or do you sound like me go to the school and then go and kind of like try out or walk onto the team um it's kind of a hybrid of that so at the time there's very little like buzz around high school rugby and just college rugby in general Okay. So whatever recruiting process you had to do was kind of on your own. So when we go to schools, we would contact the college coach ahead of the time. They would take us on a tour or whatever, um, sit down and talk to them. Other than that, there was really no like coaches reaching out to me. But for when I was on the Penn State team, I didn't have to try out. I was just on. Got it. Because I know for me, really unsure of whether I wanted to play. I figured the moment I finished high school, I hung up my cleave, calling it a day. I'm done. I went and tried out for the crew team when I landed up at Drexel. Uh, got a tryout, got was walk-on offer. But then I kind of decided against it because okay. like I had a, uh, the coach kind of came up to me and he was like, Oh yeah, uh, I have a full roster. Come back in the spring. Come back in December. I'll give you another tryout. If your times are better, I'll put you on the team. Went back and uh, trained the whole, all of first term of uh, freshman year. 
came back December. Coach was like, oh, I don't really have an, I, people didn't drop out at the rate of that. I thought they were going to drop out. I was like, oh, well, I, like I'm literally in great shape now. What do I do? So he's like, I don't, you can come back in the fall, right? Try out because I know I'll have spaces then. It's like, all right, you know what? This is on the fence. And one of the guys from the, one of the guys in the men's club that I played for in high school, his friend was one of the coaches at Drexel. So he reached out to him saying, Hey, I have this guy coming out. So then I'm like, all right, you know what? I'll start. Like, I'll just go run. It was, we were indoors. So I knew we weren't going to be hitting. I was like, we'll go, I'll go run drills with these guys. Stay in shape. I always viewed rugby as that uh, tempting mistress who kind of always drags you back in. Basically. Yeah. So went back, played, and I'm like, all right, I guess I guess this is what I'm doing now. What, what were the main differences that you saw between playing in high school and playing in college? Loads. Well, for one, it was definitely um, more physical. Okay. Um, and just generally, obviously, better. Um, high school, you could get away with not having um, a flow or really any sense of a plan. It kind of just... It's a free for all. Okay. Especially USA rugby, high school rugby in USA. But college, you definitely have a plan, you have a flow. Um, try to stick to that offense, know your strengths and weaknesses. So yeah, you needed a lot of team chemistry for that to happen? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I think that's something we um we were really good at. Something we had in spades is uh, the chemistry. We were pretty tight as a team. Was there a level of nationals or was there a national tournament that you guys played in as well? Or mm-hmm. how did that so work? we started off with the D1A championship. It changed halfway through. So we started off freshman year. We lost to Dartmouth first round. Didn't see that coming. And then sophomore year, we lost to Cal. And then junior year is probably when we did the best. Yeah, who we played in the first round. But then we beat Arizona um, at home, played really well that game, and then pulled a big upset and beat BYU away at BYU, which I think we're only like the second team at the time to ever beat them at home. Um, That was a big win, great game. And then ended up losing the life again um, down at life. And the same thing, senior year, lost life. So you guys were actually much bigger than um, most other schools because like – you guys actually traveled to two other places beyond like a hundred mile radius. Oh yeah. You guys didn't do that often, but for like the big playoff games, we'd go. Got it. So you had that. Um, did you also participate in the college rugby championships or the CRCs? That yep. Is it called? yep. How was that? That was, was awesome. that the sevens tournament. Yep. That's sevens. That was in June. Um, What's cool about that is our school would end, our semester would end in May, mm-hmm. first couple, first week in May, and then we'd stay at school, whoever wanted to play sevens, and we would stay there for a month training pretty much like a professional rugby team with no school, no worries, and it was great. We were the only ones on campus. We would train for that, for the big, the big show in early June, and that was cool because it was in a big stadium live tv national tv family friends stuff like that it's good fun yeah i remember we got our invite in 2013 no 2014 was our first year that we got the invite we got the invite 2013 to play for the 2014 championship we got spanked against all you guys because you guys were a different league altogether penn state army life a dartmouth showed up berkeley showed up arizona showed up all you guys i was like dear lord these guys are on a different level so all american i know we were talking about that before how is that how did that work um what is all american compared to what we're used to with the football american how does that so i uh, i got I was second team all american for um 15s my junior and senior year um i think that arizona my Junior year, regular season really helped me out to get there. Um, had a good junior year. It, and it helped that my coach or coach for a little bit, sophomore year, what ended up being the head coach for the All-Americans, James okay. Brooks. Um, and he saw that potential and invited me to the camp that summer, going junior, senior year. That was really exciting. Um it's kind of similar to football. We go for like a week camp tryout, 
Um, that's over in Glendale. And that was a great opportunity to learn a lot, see what the next level is really. So how did that one week kind of like add to your experience? I mean, it would have added, but like, was there a difference between like what you were used to playing at uh, the, the level of playing that you were playing at Penn State versus All-American different altogether or... Yeah, a little bit. Um, All Americans, basically, just the best players, obviously, in the U.S. So it was like an all-star team, and so you're getting looks from all sorts of different people, different cultures, because you get some funny talkers there as well that know a little bit more than you, maybe, and you get to learn a little bit more, especially okay. the coaches too. So were they kind of brought in for it, or were they students who were lit in the country who kind of also happened who grew up? outside who came in or who grew up playing outside and then came to the u.s and then happened to some so some players came to the u.s to go to school mm-hmm. to uni and then just played rugby and then some are americans obviously that just good enough at the time so going pro did all i'm assuming all american really helped with that kind of getting noticed yeah. uh comparatively mm-hmm. when did you know that you wanted to actually like pursue rugby as a career if uh if you will i would say early early in college there was the the first like P- plr professional R- prl that came and gone pretty quickly but it was kind of like a glimpse of like all right this might be popular uh possible and then as it went on mlr became popular and a real thing i'm like all right i'll probably want to do this didn't really have a plan otherwise. I was lucky to be, I was first puck, picked up by Atlanta, was going to go down there. And then last second, got an email from a friend on the team, a text from a friend on the team said, don't sign yet. Um, the guys from Old Glory want to talk to you. Ended up talking to them. I liked what was going on there and made the switch. Yeah, I think I remember I was playing at Rutgers when your dad was kind of like, your dad was coaching there during this whole process. So yeah. he was entirely like, yeah, Chicken's doing this. He's doing this. Oh, no, he's doing that. So he was more than excited. Yeah, they were stoked. <clears throat> so was it more of a combine tryout kind of thing for both Atlanta and Old Glory? Or was it kind of like what they saw in either your, your collegiate games or uh, you playing All-American, which you're like, okay, this is the guy we want to... Yeah, so it was mostly just like um, they saw me, reached out to me. Um, it was before the college draft. Okay. So it was mainly them reaching out to me. Definitely All-Americans helped. Um, CRC has definitely helped um, showing both sides of my game, both tactical and obviously being a dynamic player. And then I made a camp, got invited to a camp in Colorado. That helped for a little good amount, just getting my name out there for really. I was signed at that point, but still learning some more. So when you were playing All-American, what was the difference between that and then playing for the USA Eagles in Colorado? Were there two different instances altogether? Well, I never played for the Eagles, not yet. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I've only been, I played against them briefly in a scrimmage we had out there. And that was great to see what the next level is. It's like, all right, so these guys are where you want to be. Now you have your benchmark, go get it. I experienced that uh, 2014. USA Eagles were playing All Blacks uh, B-side and New Zealand flew out to Philadelphia. So I headed to the gym, uh, the school gym that morning. And there's a picture of it on my Instagram. I walk in, I see these two guys, huge behemoths, uh, working out at the school gym. And I saw that they were both wearing, one was wearing a hoodie, one was wearing a tank. Both said USA Eagles on them. I was like, oh, okay, maybe they're fans. They know the game is good today anyway. They may be going to go watch the game later. Right after that, I as I started getting closer, I'm like, wait, they have Eagle USA Eagles shorts as scrum shorts as well as the socks on I'm like, okay these guys are a little more than just that either they're extreme fans or they have something to do with the team and i just kind of approach them, hey well, you guys rub you guys you turn around and you go yeah uh we actually like well, yeah, we're with the usa eagles like, oh okay that's awesome is yeah one of the guys was the forwards coach and the other guy was uh, uh was a lock and they were both just casually working out at the student gym i'm like huh okay then about two hours later, we had a call from our coach. The New Zealand All Blacks want to run a quick scrimmage before the game tonight. Wow. If you can get here now, get here. They need numbers to play against. I'm like, I felt so bad because I couldn't go. I tried to like plead with my professor for like an hour. Yo, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Can you please let me go? Like, excuse me for this one time. He goes, we have a quiz. Um, unfortunately, this is like, I, I can't miss it. 
Yeah. I'm like, dude, that's not even cool. I ran in. I literally did it. I was like, took the quiz, booked it out of there, went like seven blocks out of uh, off campus to go to the practice, our practice field. They literally at that point just started packing up shop. Yeah. I was so the town, upset. Uh, the town energy, right? What? The Talent Energy Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. It was the same place that um. Seriously. Seriously, replied out. Yeah. Yeah, they changed the name a couple years back, like town. Uh, okay, maybe I haven't been back to Philly in uh, like four years now, so. Hot minute. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, yeah, it was a Philly Union Stadium, is what we called it. So, what do you look? Do you know what you're looking at for the future? Uh, how is the future of MLR, uh, MRL, MLR look? I mean, it's looking pretty good right now. Um, we're still in the building stages, I reckon, for uh, the MLR. We're still getting big names like Cecil Africa just signed with uh, San Diego, who's absolute all star for South Africa. We're getting big names, Ma Namu, Fastero, all those yeah. big guys. Still, even with us, we, we got Threatened Palama, who's has many, many caps for the U.S., all sorts of guys from Canada and New Zealand. So people are, de- there's definitely interest here. And plus, people want to come to the U.S. So yeah. it's, I think it's only going to grow. Okay. Um, coronavirus probably didn't help the, a lot, but that's obvious. But I see us, um, DMR going pretty far. Yeah, I kind of did get that sense. When we were talking about the first CRCs that I went to in twenty four June of 2014, that's when uh prl made their first debut and they were like testing the water so like in that one they had like between a game that we played with um against cal just after that is when uh prl kind of like had their their first test match if you will Mm -hmm. um to see to kind of gauge interest and that's where i remember i was like i don't know how this is gonna work because they were playing a sevens format double the time of the regular sevens time so sevens is 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 two halves of seven um, minutes was, um it was like super sevens or something like that it was four periods of seven minutes yeah 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 so as opposed to just such a regular two seven minute halves that we have in sevens it was literally four seven minute quarters yeah but i'm like i don't know how it's gonna work because the, the game's gonna be over in like a half hour right that's rough yeah and here's the thing it's rough when you're playing it because like we, I, I've also played sevens. You, you've clearly played a lot of sevens. It's rough when you're playing it for that seven minutes. It's like it feels like the longest seven minutes of your life, but yeah. also flies like nobody's business. From a audience perspective, I was like, I don't think America's at a point where they can handle a fourteen minute game. Yeah, because they have a quick attention span. Yeah, that's why it's, sevens is so popular. It's just quick action, fourteen minute games. All right, new game. It's it's quick energy. It is, but I also, one thing that I felt about it was I always, I found it interesting that you have to be into rugby to understand sevens. Otherwise, sevens aren't really games that we play. It's literally a tournament, which we're playing from nine o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the evening. Elimination, single elimination as it keeps going. So you have to like watch the whole thing. What I always felt was it would be similar to like the US Open where you're there for literally the whole day. But if you just have one seven minute game, I don't think that I didn't think it was going to get too far because you're either not going to get too much out of it from a viewer perspective or it's like I literally came here to watch and this is over in 10 minutes. Yeah. I think it's like the opposite. I think it's really? the opposite. Yeah. I think it's like high energy, high action, quick games, keeps people interested. Like that's why I got picked up in the Olympics. It was just something new. It's interesting. You know, 15s it can be a little bit slower. It's like yeah. more tactical, strategic, slower, but sevens is fast. No, I, I agree entirely. From a from a excitement level, sevens is much more exciting, especially as both of us are backs. It's, it's sevens is a backs game at the end of the day, right? It's mm-hmm. a lot of space. A lot of the big guys kind of stay away because it's a lot of space ground to cover, and it's very high intensity. But from a where I was saying was kind of finding the right median where the person who's going to be watching it is going to not only enjoy it for the 14 minutes but also kind of like stay there for this x amount of hours where they will keep their attention Mm -hmm. because like i don't know so sevens tournaments when i was playing it was like you get there at seven uh 7 30 kickoff is at eight you're there from eight to five right if you if you last through generally if we didn't we kind of left but 
that's also too long for the average viewer to stay at a tournament mm -hmm. and like keep that same amount of attention unless they're absolute rugby fans so in many international countries where that's the name that's the name of the game like they they've grown up watching that they're used to it but on the other hand if you're trying to introduce something i kind of was like this i don't know how this is going to work but i felt mlr did a better um job of trying to gain more momentum because it's nearly replicating the same timeline which the viewers are there's the average viewer is going to be comfortable with mm -hmm. yeah all right you're there for 80 minutes so football game is roughly this it's 60 minutes so people will keep their interest because i can keep my interest for up to 90 minutes beyond that keeping that same amount of interest can be daunting absolutely so you're you're still really new into the league so there's no real like oh so when are you looking to how long are you looking to play but how is the combine by the way no the combine being the draft i know we mentioned the draft aspect of it the college draft that happened this past june how did that work if you know so basically from what i understood i didn't really follow it that closely okay much as i should have but from what i understood it was so you can send in you can apply put yourself in the pool um attach like highlight film or resume rugby resume stuff like that and um coaches will look through it look through the player pool see what they want um unfortunately there wasn't a lot of spots so i think only like 20 or so people got picked okay. a lot of people i knew so that was cool to watch that uh shout out connor mooneyham first round draft pick overall but it, yeah it was cool um definitely good for the sport it's definitely moving in the right direction hopefully they do it again next year okay yeah it was more just like looking at highlights it wasn't so much a um combine ish and try out that way or was that also part of it there was no combine um there might have been if there if it wasn't for uh the coronavirus which okay. had like so it was supposed to happen earlier, but that hit, so they pushed it back. It was June 4th or 5th was the thing, right? Yeah, I think or so. Or thereabouts. Yeah, it was, and there was obviously, like, talking to coaches, stuff like that. It wasn't just all online. You go to, like, visits and see the facilities, talk to the coaches. So in that sense, it was kind of like the NFL, where you would go in person, see, see what the whole deal is. So I think the big question that we kind of try to address here is, what has rugby taught you? What, how has it impacted your life? I mean, it, clearly it has had a huge impact on your life. What has it taught you? What is some advice that you can give for people who may be looking to start or parents who may want to venture out into other sports that their children can try? Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's obviously had a massive impact on my life, not only with my career, but my personality as well. It's, people say it's kind of like a, a cult almost. Because mm -hmm. you see somebody with a rugby jacket on, you immediately have it's something that you two are, I don't want to say connected with, but something you both share, a passion you both share. And not many people have that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, it's, it's a great culture. The rugby culture is something that's unique for sure. Kind of hard to explain. But yeah, if you play rugby, you're, you're welcome almost anywhere. There's rugby people. So. That's cool. And also just like it's a sport where brotherhood is definitely encouraged and it comes in spades. No, I get exactly what you mean. The jackets like I've met people, I've seen people at the gym walking down the street where I met a guy who went to Rensselaer up in uh, Al Albany area, Troy. He was wearing a the rugby quarter zip and that's almost a jacket that you wear, which you exactly like you said. I saw him like, hey, wait, you play rugby too? That in itself is the icebreaker. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. That in itself. I saw. I remember I ran into this girl at the gym. She's played at um up in Nova Scotia. And like, she's just wearing a random rugby, uh, uh, St. Francis something, uh, University Rugby. I'm like, wait, you play too? And like, you, they don't look at you weird the moment you say that. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, you actually know rugby? Yeah, in America that is because people. Yeah, because I can't count my fingers how many times I've had that conversation with people, and it just instantly sparks the conversation. My go-to is what position do you play? And like, I had one girl I remember I ran into the mall. She was wearing a Penn State rugby sh uh, rugby shirt. The first person I thought of actually was you. I'm like, oh, what position do you play? Maybe you know this guy. She's like, oh, actually, I don't play. This is my friend's shirt. I'm like, oh uh -huh. god, it's one of those. Okay. 
I was like, forget it. I'm not, I'm not going to bother like continuing this. Just asking what position do you play? The moment you ask that question, you don't get as weird of a look as you do from any other sports. And it's already given that you understand the sport. I remember I ran and saw a guy wearing scrum shorts, ends up, I played against him three weeks prior at Princeton. So mm-hmm. that's, ex- I get exactly what you mean that like it in itself is like an immediately distinctifying factor. Yeah. And they'll, they'll talk to you and you get invited to certain places where like, almost as though I just met you, but we're going to go socialize later on because of this one mutual connection. Exactly. It's a very social welcoming culture, which you don't find with most things. Like you said earlier, after games, you would go grab a slice of pizza or a drink with them. And you don't get that with really any other sport. Sure. Literally, you almost broke my hand, but here's a slice of pizza. Or here's a drink for those people who do drink. Yeah. And it's like, all right, um, remember we were ring 2019. We were playing this team from Canada who came down. Uh, Princeton also was playing a friendly against them. And the first thing that Princeton did was, guys, we're having a party. You're all invited. Now, this is a place where, like, actually, if you think about it, you really don't get invited to clubs like that. And these guys just openly, yeah, sure, come through. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. For sure. So as you told me earlier, golf is another huge passion of yours. How did that come about? Uh, I don't know. It's a real old man thing to like, I guess. Um, I don't know. Ever since I was little, I liked golfing. And then recently, um, it really just took off. I was trying to think of what, like, when I just started really going in about it. And I don't know. It's like, there's something about it. Just instant satisfaction if you hit a good shot or whatever. It's the most frustrating game in the world, but I love it. It's in the way I look at it is it's a sport which, unless you somebody introduced it to you when you were really young and kind of like forced you to go to golf lessons and then like you grew to enjoy it, it's an interesting sport because, like you said, it's a very older person's sport. So, up until high school, kids didn't golf, but the moment you get to college, everyone golfs. So you're kind of like, oh, okay, like this is something I have to do. Yeah, and it's, it's just a good skill to have. Like, yeah. If you get invited somewhere and it's like, oh, do you golf? Like, uh, I could. There's a trailer for this movie I'm really pumped about. I think it either just came out or it's coming out in the next few days it's called The Banker. Um, Samuel L. Jackson's in it. It's a great movie. I can't wait to watch it. And there's one line in it in which he says they're basically trying to train a uh, actor and waiter at one of his restaurants to be a frontman for their banking business back in the 1950s. Okay. These uh, Samuel Jackson, another guy, I'm forgetting his name. They want to be bankers and they want to buy a bank, Mm -hmm. but being black, they really don't know how to approach it in the 1950s Mm -hmm. from a external perspective. They understand the whole game, but they kind of need a frontman. Yeah. So you get this young guy, uh, young white guy who's an actor, aspiring actor in Los Angeles, who's also working as a waiter. So the one thing that he says is, we, he says, I know nothing about banking. I know nothing about any of this high society stuff. Mm-hmm. He goes, listen, we'll teach you all of that. But the one thing, and you can fake all of it. You're an actor. You can learn to fake it. But there's one thing that you can't fake. He says, okay, what's that? He goes, a good golf stroke. You can't fake a good golf stroke. That's the only thing you can. I'm like, it is so true. And like, they literally started training him in that. And that's in the trailer. I couldn't, I didn't understand what that meant until like fairly recently. I'm like, dude, he's actually right. Like you can't fake it. That's pretty much it for me. Um, Is there any parting shots that you'd like to kind of advice or things that you'd like to give to following your passions or getting to where you got? Cause you're actually pursuing your, one of your passions. Yeah, um, just do what you love, really. That's what it comes down to. Um, like, I could be having a, you know, ordinary job, go with the normal route, but I decided to obviously not make as much money at the time, um, but really do what I want to do, do what I love, something I've dreamed of since I was a little kid. Um, and if you have the opportunity, definitely shoot for it. And if not, still try. Um, you're If you're young... You got a lot of time. Got it. Yeah, of course. Um, I think that is a huge thing that like a lot of us are facing at this kind of point of our lives or I'm in my mid twenties, you're still in your early twenties. The huge thing that we're facing is like, do I go a route where I make a lot of money right now and enjoy my life or enjoy as much as I can while I'm young? Or 
do I follow my passion and kind of like be willing to forego X amount of the money that I could potentially make, be making, but I'm doing what I love, mm-hmm. right? I think that's a huge thing. Like I'm facing it too. Um, and the entrepreneurship route, like I do know I want to get into uh, business and I kind of want to start, like, venture into those fields. But if I, when I look at it comparatively, like if I just go into tech right now, I have friends who are in 25 making six figures already. Right. Mm-hmm. And within like, this is their second or third job. They're making six figures. And I'm like, okay, which way do I want to go? Do I want to go that route? I make a lot of money real fast or do I want to follow one of my passions? But I may not make that in the next five years. Mm-hmm. Five years down the line, there may be a huge scope. One actual last point, because I do want to ask this. Do you see a future for you in coaching or do you already coach? That's just some for you to say that because um, my buddy, Jimmy, a couple of buddies said that like, oh, I can see you being a coach. And at the time, and at, uh, during college, I'm like, no, I hate coaching, like dealing with the, kids or whatever i can probably see myself coaching um further down the line i still have a lot to learn but um i can definitely see that at some point if it does go that route yeah i've um i've always contemplated it because i've been told very similar things like you'd you'd make a good coach but then i may look at starting at a local like club level Mm -hmm. and seeing where it takes me anyway that's it for me thank you mike for coming on the show uh thank you dad for volunteering you to come on to the show (laughs) um that was the funniest i like i told you i asked him to just give me an introduction with you to kind of ask you if you'd be down to be on the show and he's kind of just like he'll do it i'm like um no offense coach should that be his decision to make he goes nope he, he needs to practice he's gonna be in front of cameras a lot he needs to practice he'll do it yeah so like, oh, I, right. I come home i'm pretty hungover come back home and he's like oh yeah you have a uh, interview in like 20 minutes i go excuse me <laughs> he says yeah i uh, signed you up for an interview with an old player of mine like uh, can we do it tomorrow? He goes, all right, sure. Yeah, that's when he texted me. He's like, can we do it tomorrow? Because he told me you're coming back from DC and all uh, that day. Yeah, he's yeah. like, it may be late. And I'm like, it's late is fine with me, but make sure, like, see if he wants to. He, And then I remember the funny thing is I, when I told my dad, that's what your dad said. He goes, he laughed because he does that quite often with me too. He literally just come back like, oh, by the way, you have this in like a week. You have this that you're going to do. I'm like, I, I did what now? I remember yeah. my first half marathon that I ran. My dad's a marathoner. Uh, he used to run a lot. He comes home one day and he's like, oh, by the way, um, you're running a half marathon in two weeks. Just letting you know. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, yeah, you just have to be ready. Jeez. Thanks, dad. Give me less of a notice. Yeah. I'm not a distant, like... The, the issue is I ne- I ran cross country back in middle school and uh, middle school. I haven't run cross country since I used to run to keep fit, but like 13 miles is not exactly a 5k. No, it's, it's a far way. Yeah. So he literally, it was six runs and then like, that's it. Bang race day. It was actually up in Morristown. It was in uh, the Morristown superhero half marathon. It okay. was, yeah, you have two weeks and like he he would do this all the time. He's like, "Oh, um, you're gonna be on a panel. Dis- you're gonna be in a panel discussion on this topic in two days, okay?" I guess. So when I told him that your dad volunteered you for like being on the my the show, he was like, "See, I'm not the only one. Yep, Classic. all good dads volunteer their kids, saying you'll benefit from this later on." Yes. So. Anyway, thank you, Mike, again for being on the show. Thank you for offering your experiences of playing rugby and becoming a pro rugby player. Thank you all for listening. Please be sure to subscribe, like, and share. You can follow me on Inception Point Podcast on Instagram, YouTube. Thank you again, Mike, for being on our show. My pleasure. Uh, and we'll catch up. All right? Absolutely. Yep. All right, perfect. Perfect.